Good morning, Ethos Church. We love having you all here in person and tuned in online this morning. Hey, listen, if this is your first time with us today, welcome. We're so excited to have you here and to meet you. Do us a favor, grab your phones and text Ethos New to 94000 and fill out the card that you get right to your phone. This is our way of just being able to connect with you and get to know you even more. And even better than that, for every card that gets filled out, we'll donate on your behalf to an amazing local organization called She Has a Name, who is fighting human trafficking right here in the city. So thank you again for being with us today and hanging out. Ethos, we're so thankful that you continue to be a church that lives and gives open-handedly. If you're new to checking us out today, we want you to just enjoy, experience, and learn about who we are as a church. For those who are giving generously today, we want to let you know about a new way you can give. You now have the option to give using Venmo. Just search at ethosoh and you can easily give that way, as well as you can still use all of our other simple and secure options that are showing right here on the screen. You can choose the text to give, you can give online, or you can give as you leave the auditorium today in the box. If you've been a part of Ethos for any length of time, then you know that we value starting the year off in prayer together as a church family. Beginning January 10th, we'll be kicking off our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Each year we see and hear amazing stories that come out of this time of corporate prayer. So we would love for you to join in with us. Mark your calendars and stay tuned for more details this week. We're so thankful and proud of our creative and worship teams. They pour all they have into each and every worship experience week in and week out. And I'm grateful and honored to be a part of those teams and to serve alongside those incredible people. We wanna see these teams keep growing and to help more people tap into their gifts and to continue to honor God with them. If you've ever thought about or considered being a part of these teams, we would love to invite you to a team night just for you. This will be an opportunity for you to enjoy community with your fellow creatives and it'll be a safe and pressure-free space where you will have the chance to hear more about these teams, how they operate and function, and how you may fit into them. I personally am so excited to see you there. Join us Monday, January 17th at 6 p.m. and stay tuned for more details. Well, hey, thank you so much for being here today. We're so excited to dive into a new teaching this morning. Let's lean in together. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Ethos. Uh, for those of you who were expecting JS this morning, you got him, but not Jordan Smucker. So Jordan is sick today. My name is Jamie Schistler, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to teach this morning. If Jordan, if you're listening, we hope you're feeling better. Uh, but welcome, everyone, you know, and Happy New Year. The new year tends to be a time where some of us maybe are checking church out again for the first time, or maybe we made a commitment in 2022. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to reconnect with God a little more. I'm going to come to church a little more. And if that's you today online or here in person, well, welcome. Welcome to Ethos. We're really glad that you're checking us out in the new year. As I said, my name is Jamie Schistler. And I'm a member of the stewardship team here at Ethos. That's our board of our governance team, our board of governing elders at, at the church. My wife, Mandy, and I and our two daughters, we have two middle school age daughters, so pray for me a little harder uh, this afternoon, if you don't mind. Uh, but we've been calling Ethos home for the last two years. And as I said, just a privilege to be able to serve as a servant leader and to be able to, to share a little bit today uh, as we kick off the new year um, the right way with a Buckeye win and a cold winter Sunday morning. So before we dive in, let's just uh, invite God into our space. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for new beginnings and new years. And just thank you for this space. Thank you that we have a space to worship you, uh, hear your word, and just grow in community together. We thank you for this community that we call home, that we're able to worship freely and, and, and honor you in all that we do. May we Maybe just, God, please you this year in, in, in what we choose to prioritize in our lives and, and maybe press into the plans you have for us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, uh, to get to know me a little bit better, you know, because some of you may not know a lot about me, I wanted to share, share a picture from my childhood with each of you. So th this is me on the left with my mom. Uh, I was maybe 12 or 13 years old at the time. And that's my dad and my brother on the right. And in the middle, this guy was actually like a really big deal. I don't know if, if anyone in the room recognizes this guy, probably not a, not a ton, but this gentleman's name was Willard Scott. And Willard Scott was a weatherman for the Today Show. Now, he had much more hair then, but the Today Show, which still runs to today, not today, but it runs during the week, uh, is a morning show. And Willard Scott, every morning, would get up and do the weather 
on this very popular program. Well, the reality was, I don't know if Willard Scott was actually like a trained meteorologist. Uh, I would suspect by his forecast, he was not. But he was really, really popular. People loved watching him because he was really entertaining. He would have fun on the air. And he came to our small town to give a, to give a speech, to give a talk. I can't remember what, why he was there. But it was kind of a big deal because it was Willard Scott. He was so cool. He was on TV every morning. And I was excited to, to meet him. Because despite my kind of like Zach Morris, you know, forgive the feathered blonde hair, you know, I was going through this kind of Saved by the Bell, Zach Morris phase of my life. But there was kind of a reason I wanted to be, at that time, I really wanted to be famous. Like I thought, I didn't know what I wanted to be famous for, whether it was sports or music or entertainment or, I I had no, it wasn't my grades, I can assure you that. But I thought I was this gift that the world needed to experience, and I I really deserved to be famous. And that was kind of a dream I had. So I wanted to take an opportunity with this celebrity being in our small town. I I grew up in Portsmouth, Ohio, down in southern Ohio. I was like, I'm going to take advantage of this. Willard Scott's here. So there's a long line of people waiting to get a picture with him, waiting to, to get his autograph. And I, and I had an idea. I, I wrote my name on a, on a card, you know, signed it like it was my autograph, which I, you know, because I was going to be famous, I'd practiced a lot of times, so it looked really cool. I signed a piece of paper, and I put it in an envelope, and I handed it to Willard Scott, and it, and it read like this under my signature. A lot of people will be asking you for your autograph tonight. I wanted you to have mine because someday it's going to be worth something. Uh, now, this is going to sound probably very egotistical, which, you know, I thought I was Zach Morris, so there was probably some ego motivating what I wrote to Willard Scott. But it was actually kind of strategic, because in my mind, what Willard Scott would do often was he would get on air, and he would talk about people he met, because he kind of went around the country, and he'd go to county fairs, and he'd go to, you know, he'd throw out the first pitch at a baseball game, he'd go do these things, and then he'd say, like, oh, when I was in Memphis, I met so-and-so. Or when I was in New Orleans, I got to talk to so-and-so. And And I thought, okay, well, I I want to be famous, and Willard Scott's here, and maybe if I do something kind of out of the ordinary, he'll bring me up on the air. And then this career that I've been dreaming about will just start to skyrocket. Well, a couple days later, I'm watching, and so I'm I'm getting up every morning, I'm watching the Today Show, I'm like, yeah, dude, I know it's going to rain, but like, are you going to say my name? Well, lo and behold, he actually gets on air and he says, like, I just want to, you know, give a shout out to Bessie who celebrates her 105th birthday today in Tupelo, Mississippi. And I also want to give a shout out to my new friend, Jamie Schistler in Portsmouth, Ohio. And I was like, oh my gosh. And you have to understand, like I tell my kids, there was no TikTok at this time. I could not go viral in any digital format. Like, this was it. This was my chance to go viral. And I was like, oh man, it is happening. I'm going to go into the seventh grade and I'm going to be met with like paparazzi, you know, maybe, maybe an agent will be waiting for me. And the reality was the only thing waiting for me that day was like a crappy cafeteria lunch. Like it, life just didn't really change. Like I showed up and the fact of the matter was it, it nothing really changed for me. Um, so did I become famous? No, I did not. And some people might ask, well, why is that? Well, the reality was I was just a kid with a dream. I wasn't really a mature person with a plan of how to achieve it. I just kind of thought in my head that this was something that could happen for me. And, and why am I even bringing this up? Well, the reality is in the new year, so many of us are, are reflecting backward on a year that was and looking forward, as Weston said, to a year that is to come. And perhaps we have a vision of what that year might look like. We have something in our mind of, this is what I want to do or what I want to achieve or, or what I want to see happen. And a lot of us make goals, and we use that turn of the calendar as an opportunity to set goals. In fact, two out of three Americans, they say, actually make a New Year's resolution. And I know some of you are probably like, well, guess what? I'm one of those three that does not. I'm not a New Year's resolutions person. That is not me. And even, even goal setting, you might say, yeah, that's for people who want to lose weight or that's for people who are on sports teams or 
people who are in business and have business goals to achieve. But I, I believe the reality is God, the God of the universe, wants us to set goals. Certainly he wants us to dream as that young guy on the screen was a dreamer, but, but the reality is he wants us to set goals. Goals. And today we're going to be talking about what it looks like when we press into what we're going to call godly goals for our life. But the first thing I want to kind of, kind of talk about is the difference between a dream and a goal. Because the reality is that, that that young guy on the screen, he was a dreamer, right? I had a dream. Well, a dream written down with a date actually then becomes a goal, right? Like, I want to do this by this date, and I'm committing to writing it down on a piece of paper. There's, there's some formality. There's some, there, there's, I've put it in writing now. Like, can you, can you imagine when, as a parent, sometimes we tell our kids, well, it's in writing. Like, you have to clean your room before you get to play on your phone. It, it, makes, it makes it more, more real. And that's, that's why that when we write down our dreams, it then becomes a goal. And then breaking that goal down into, into steps of how we're going to achieve it, that becomes a plan. And what we're going to talk about today is God was, God was a planner. God thought in steps of how the, the world would sequence his, his purpose and mission. And then if we, plan, if we take a plan and back it up with action, well, that's then fulfilling our dreams. And it's just this continuum of a dream broken down into steps and plans and then ultimately moved into to action. Well, the reality is so many of us are dreamers not necessarily doers. There's a great quote by an author named Brad Montague who wrote the book series Kid President. And he said, dare to dream, but also do. Dreamers are plenty, but doers are few. Because the reality is we, we all have this vision of, of how life can be different or how we could maybe better ourselves or how we could make a larger impact. But when it actually comes down to doing it, and taking action. Something holds us back. Something maybe, maybe tells us we can't or we shouldn't or, or it's not the right time or you're too busy. And what we know about God is God planned and he took action. If we learn anything from, 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 from a goal setting around godly goals is that they were planned and then God took action. Nothing was accidental when it came to God's plans. Nothing just happened without circumstance. It was, everything was intentional, and God planned it out. And if we're to be designed, if we, if we are all designed in God's image, then he wants us to set goals and then take action upon them. That's his goal for all of us. When he designed every human being in his image, is that we become more and more like him, and God was a planner, and God was a doer. What I want to make sure I preface, though, is that as we set goals... Oftentimes, in today's society, we, we set goals focusing solely on the outcome. The reality is God is more interested in the journey and who are we becoming, right? Because we, we just want to get from here to here. And God, I want it to happen as fast as it possibly can. My goals are to lose weight. My goals are to do this. My goal, I just want to get there. And God's like, yeah, I care about you if you get there, but Really what I'm most interested in is the heart that you're cultivating and developing along this journey. That's what he cares the most about. Does he want us to succeed and hit our goals? Absolutely. But he wants to shape our character along the way. And that's the first thing we'll talk about in setting godly goals. And the first thing to know about it is that setting godly goals actually draws us closer to God. This is really the foundation of what we're going to talk about this morning. Because as I said, the reality is our God was a goal setter. Our God was a planner. Our God was a, was a doer. He didn't just dream this world into reality, right? Like, oh, just dream it and it happens. Or, or our lives were not just dreamed into reality. It took, it took planning and it took doing. We see on, on several occasions in Scripture God talking about plans and specifically plans for our lives. This is Psalm 139, verse 15 and 16 where David writes, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now, imagine this, the the planning that took place here. Every day of everyone's life recorded 
and written down and, and thoughtfully planned out. I have a hard time even getting my calendar straight you know, before a busy week at work or planning a vacation and, and, and enough things that we're going to do during the week. And, and the God of the universe said, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plan this out. I have, I, have a, I have a purpose for each and every individual life. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is if God has these plans for our lives in 2021, 2022, 2028, he has these plans. Are we asking him what they are? Are we entering 2022 saying, God, what is it that you've written down for my life? If we're not pressing in and asking the Lord what goals he has for our lives, we're ultimately letting others determine what's most important to us. And we're allowing our priorities to be set by the world and not by the creator of the world. I love this quote from author Aaron Sansony, who says, It's much better to live by design than by default. God designed our days. He designed us to be created in his image and to be more and more like him and more and more like Jesus. But ultimately what ends up happening in in our daily lives is we default to whatever is most important. We default to what is the newest trend or the newest craze or whatever will make us feel better in our communities or our jobs or our neighborhoods or our schools. And God's saying, no, I've, I've, I've designed a life for you that's great and beautiful and wonderful. Getting God, setting godly goals is about aligning our priorities to his and then determining what are those next steps to take. As it says in Proverbs 16, 9, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. So as we submit to, to God and say, God, I, I want to set these plans up with you, and in partnership with you. And then, God, will you direct my next steps to action so I can then make a difference in the world that is honoring you and glorifying you? Will you guide me along the way? This is a spiritual discipline. I believe there are spiritual disciplines, worship, prayer, that ultimately draw us closer to God and living out our purpose. And I believe setting goals, setting godly goals, for our lives that align with the vision he has for us is a spiritual discipline just like prayer and worship. They draw us closer to him. They allow us to live on mission to fulfill what he set forth in our lives. And if you're unsure, kind of, if you're unsure, well, what does God have planned for me? What, I don't even know where to begin to know what he's recorded in terms of my days. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to start as we enter the 21 days of prayer and fasting which you'll find all those resources on the website. It's a great time in those 21 days. Say, God, help guide my steps in this new year. Help me to be on mission to live the life that you designed me to live. The second thing we want to know about godly goals is they need to be big. I love what Weston said in the beginning about, let's just dare to dream a little bit bigger this new year. Let's dare to be a little bit bigger. These are the five things when I said in the beginning, two out of three Americans set a New Year's resolution of something they want to see in the new year, a change. These are the five most, most common things people resolve to do. They want to exercise more. They want to lose weight, which feel part and parcel the same. They want to get organized. They want to read more. They want to save more money. And all these things are, are good. There's nothing wrong with exercising, losing weight, reading, saving more money. And, and, and particularly if you kind of Take the next step of them. I want to save more money so I can help the needy. I want to exercise more so I can live longer and be around my loved ones. But if you kind of just look at them in isolation, without any context and without any words after each of them, they're actually kind of vague. They're actually kind of small. Reading more. Okay, reading what? Reading how often? Exercising more. Well, How much are you exercising now? More might mean walking from here to the end of the stage. I don't know. In my mind, they're, they're, they are things that we know in some way we can actually achieve on our own. That without any intervention from, from God or, or something different or something more powerful than us, we could probably achieve all of these things. But the reality is, on the surface, they're not particularly kingdom-changing. They might change our lives, they might change our appearance, but are they really changing the kingdom of God? Now, if there's one thing I want us to really think about and leave here today 
kind of chewing on and wrestling with is that we need the size of our goals to actually reflect the size of our God. The smaller we make our goals, the smaller we're actually making God in our lives to do something extraordinary. And we all want to witness and be part of the extraordinary. Going out on a big goal is awesome because it requires huge faith. Rick Warren talked about, the pastor Rick Warren in Saddleback Church in California, encouraged people to take chances. And he said, his quote was, go out on a limb because that's where all the fruit is. If you're hanging out down to the bottom of the trunk, there's not a lot of, that's not where the fruit is produced. And to get fruit from our lives, we got to try new things. we got to be bolder. We have to say, God, I know you can, you can do the impossible, and I want to see it come to fruition in this new year. So are our goals, are the size of our goals reflecting the size of our God? The smaller we make him, the less opportunity we have to see his power. Look at Paul's writing with me in Ephesians 3.20. Where Paul writes, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Not, not, well, you know, God working within us can do a little bit more, or 15% more, or I don't, infinitely more. His power is infinite when we invite him in and he works within us. And I love that it says his power will be within us. The power of the, of, of the almighty God working within us to do what? Accomplish. We want to accomplish something in 2022. Let's, let's think boldly and, and invite God into, a, into our lives and into our hearts and, and say, God, I don't even know what I'm asking for, but I know whatever it is, you can achieve infinitely more than anything I could ask you or I could think of myself. And I think part of the problem when we, when we set goals is that we set the bar almost too low. <laughs> we don't invite the opportunity for God to come into our, into our goals and, and bring them to a place that we never thought was possible. We kind of we kind of said to ourselves, well, I'm, I'm going to, for whatever reason, maybe we got burned or maybe we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't do as well as we thought we would do in 2021. So we actually set the bar way down here. And people often say, if you aim at nothing, you're likely to hit it. Another way of saying it, and this was a quote from Michelangelo, who, as we know, painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and, and did it with such precision and such grace and, and used such talent to do it. He didn't just go to Sherwin-Williams and buy a, a can of whatever and roll it on the ceiling. You know, this was the great Michelangelo. And he said, the great danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and actually achieving our mark. We tend to have these dreams as a kid. You know, we have the, as a kid, we tend to set our aim really high. You know, as this kid on the screen that I showed you, my, my, my aim was super high. Like, man, I, I, I want this in my life. But then something happens as you get older and reality starts to set in and you're just kind of like, man, my goal, for, my goal for now is just to get through the day. Like, forget about X, Y, and Z. Or forget about something big and bold. I just want to. I just want to get from here to there. Or get through a week at work. So you start to play it safe. You're not. You're not boldly pressing into the God of the universe. You're just like, I just want to. I just want to get through today. And I think the reality is, we set goals that are that are lower, and and goals that frankly we could achieve on our own. But we also tend to kind of aren't realistic with the time that we need them to be accomplished or that they can be accomplished. So we tend to overestimate what we can do in a month, but we underestimate what we might be able to do in a year. And we completely underestimate what God might be able to do in 10. But we want to see things happen so quickly that we just set up hurdles that are pretty easy to jump over. But as we enter this new year, let's not underestimate what God can and will do in our lives when, we're just, when we just ask for bold, big, wonderful goals. And that sets up the third, the third aspect of godly goals that go, in, that go part and parcel with setting big, bold goals is that when we do that, when we, when we draw close to God, when we, when we set big goals, those goals become statements of faith. They allow the world to see that 
I am faithful that God can, can make a change in me and within my life. Want to know if you've set a godly goal or not? The best way to know is does it require you to achieve the goal or does it actually require the intervention of God in your life? Because if it's just you that can do it, if, just, if, just, if you can lose the five pounds, if you can read 10 more books this year, that's a great goal, but it may not be a godly goal. And there may be more that God can do in your life. And sometimes faith is, is just the missing ingredient we need to take us from, from, from here to here. I love the story in Matthew chapter 9 where two blind men were following Jesus and they wanted to see. That, yeah, of course they wanted to see. They'd spent their lives you know, without vision. And, and, and they encountered Jesus and Jesus says, do you want to see? And they say, of course, of course we do. And so he says, according to your faith, it will then happen. Because of your faith, not because, because of anything you've done with your bodies, not because of any plan that you, that you subscribe to and, 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 and cross off a checklist, not from any diet plan that you, that you, you know, monitored throughout the year. Through your faith, it will happen. These men probably wanted to see forever, we have to presume, right? But they had to answer the question, do you believe I can make you see? This was, Jesus, this was the question Jesus asked them as he encountered them. Do you believe that I can make you see? And I think so many of us, as we, as, as we start to take this step into 2022, and we start to draw closer to God, and we start to think about big things he may do in our lives, these, these men... I can't imagine they ever thought they would see. But gee, all they had to answer was, Jesus, do you, believe, do you believe? Do you believe that I can make you see? And they said, yes, we believe. We have faith that you can. And then the, pos- the impossible became possible. Jesus wanted to understand the condition of their hearts. Are their hearts in a place where they believe that I can do something that on their own could never, ever happen? So what question are we asking God this year? What blank do we, do we need to fill in for our own lives? Where we need to say, do you believe I can make you blank? I can make you a better parent. I can make you this at work or this in your school environment. We need to be asking ourselves, what, what do we need to demonstrate a greater faith in to see become a reality in our lives. Because when we do that, God will show up in ways that we could not even ever imagine. As it says here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, these were, these were Jesus' disciples who had wanted to heal. They wanted to perform miracles, not the way Jesus did, but, but, to, but to do some of the things that Jesus had done during his earthly life. And, and, and they wanted to, to do some of these things and help heal people that were ailing. And they said to, to Jesus, why can't we do it? Why, why can't we, you know, we're following all the steps, we're following you, why can't we do it? And Jesus says to them, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Now, it's inexplicable to even think <laughs> about telling a mountain to move. You know, we have a hard enough time telling Sometimes our kids to move from the sofa to their rooms. Imagine telling a mountain. But, but, but Jesus' point here was it's through faith that the big, the bold, the mighty can become possible. Are we inviting those things into our lives? So we've talked about our goals drawing us closer to God, our goals being big, our goals you know, being examples and statements of our faith, of what's possible. The fourth thing about godly goals is that they take time you know very simply we walk into a year where we we want immediate results in most things in life we want the results to be fairly immediate so we can move on then to the next thing and what we know about stories in the bible of of those who were so patient and and following god is that oftentimes what god had set forth in their lives didn't happen immediately it took it took time. I showed you those top five New Year's resolutions. And the reality is, after 32 days, most people had said, I've had enough. <laughs> I can't keep doing this. 32 days. 
And, and, and it was, I'm, I'm kind of done. Because the reason is they weren't seeing the results yet. That was why most people had said, well, I said I was going to exercise more and I haven't. Or I was going to lose this weight and it hasn't happened yet. Or I was going to save money and I'm actually further in debt than I thought I would be. So you know what? No harm, no foul. 32 days, my life, no big deal. I'll move on to something else. But we have to understand when we press into what God has for our lives, the results may not be immediate. 32 days in, if you haven't seen that change yet, that you know God has pressed on our hearts, my prayer for you, for myself, for this church is that we don't throw in the white flag and surrender because it takes, it takes time. When we pursue what God's will is for our lives, as I said in the beginning, it's a journey where, where things will, will go up and go down and ebb and flow, but, but ultimately it's Jesus and God working on our hearts. But we've got to be patient and I love that Weston brought up Hebrews this morning because it's such a, such a wonderful book of, where the author's writing to new followers of Jesus. These were, these were Jewish people who had made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, and they, they were having a very hard time. They were being persecuted for being new and stepping out in their faith in Jesus. And so the author writes to them and says, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. I love the idea of being confident as we enter a new year, but he writes, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. I love this because the idea of patient endurance, I I love the juxtaposition because patience is something that we think of as being very passive and endurance is something we think of as being very active. Like, I, I, I'm, an, if someone's an, I'm a marathon runner, so I need endurance. I need, I, need, I need strength. I need something physical to happen. But I also need patience because if I didn't have patience when I was running, I'd probably flame out after mile one. You've got you to gotta pace yourself. You've got you to you know, know that the 1st I've got to finish the race, and the first mile is not going to determine if I make it to the last mile. And I love what the author's saying here is he's saying, when you're following Jesus, when you're living a life on mission for God, you need patient endurance. The patience to to slow down and say, this is God's timing, not my timing. But the endurance to keep moving and keep walking and keep moving forward. Two Two of the strongest examples, I believe, in the Bible of patient endurance were Moses and Noah. You think about Moses, and this was, this was someone who kind of grabbed from obscure, obscurity, and God says, I, I want, this is what I, I need you to do, Moses. I need you to lead the Israelites and my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, I can't believe I'm the person you're asking to do this, God, but, but, but I trust you. I trust you with, with my next steps. And Moses goes out, and he's in the desert for 40 years, 40 years. Imagine if that was a resolution, it had been 32 days. Moses was out there for 40 years. He was patient because he, he was waiting for God to reveal what was next, but he endured and he kept going despite the setbacks. I think that, that, that despite the setbacks of those kind of pioneers of the Bible with, who demonstrated such patient endurance, they kept going. And the reality is long-term goals keep us from being discouraged when we experience short-term setbacks. If our goals are so, so short, then, then a setback just throws us right off, the, right off the course. But if we set long-term goals and we say, God, I think you can do something in the next 365 days or the next five years, well, then those setbacks are a little easier to come back from. And that's the fifth thing as we talk about godly goals. They're going to come with setbacks, we see all through the Bible for, with those who, who kind of pressed in and say, God, you're telling me to do something, and, and I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I'm stepping out in faith. I'm stepping out boldly on something that sounds completely crazy, but without the power of you, I, I could never do on my own. But when we do that in our lives, whether it's 2022 or sometime B.C., when, when God prompts us to try something, it's going to be met with setbacks. And the reality is, church, we'll never succeed 
more than we fail. And I, I, I don't even like saying that because the reality is we all want to succeed. No one, no one should. Imagine if I went to a job interview and they're like, well, Jamie, you know, tell, tell us about yourself. Well, I fail 30% more than I succeed. I would, not, I, would be, I would be telling this person the truth. And, but, but that's not how we want to present ourselves. We want to present ourselves as I'm, I'm successful. I, everything I do kind of works out. But, but the reality is failure is a wonderful teacher. Setback is a wonderful teacher. It's well documented. Michael Jordan, who some would argue, we've got LeBron fans in the room. We probably have Kobe Bryant fans in the room. But, but, but most people argue Michael Jordan was the best basketball player ever to play the game. Well, he didn't make his junior varsity basketball team. And a lot of people have, have talked about this story, how Michael Jordan tried out for junior, or I think it was JV basketball, probably sophomore in high school. He didn't make the team. And this was the guy who ended up having one of the best careers ever in professional basketball. He very easily could have just said at that point, at that setback, well, you know what, maybe I'll pursue music. Or maybe I'll pursue uh, acting, or I'll pursue cooking, or I don't even know what. He did pursue baseball at one point in his career. But he knew, I have a talent, and I have a gift from God to pursue. So this was a setback, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to learn from this disappointment. So when all of us, when, when we fail, not if, when we fail, we should challenge ourselves to be glad about it. Because the, the, the fact of the matter is we're one step closer to success when something sets us back. As Jesus says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. My power works best in weakness. And Paul goes on to write, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Imagine this, where, where when we set goals at the beginning of the year and we tell maybe our community or we tell our coworkers or we tell people we go to class with, like, hey, my goal for the year is to, to do this. And imagine it didn't happen. Do you think we're posting about that on Instagram? Like, hey, everybody, I just want to let you know that I gained four pounds and I wanted to lose eight. God bless you if someone does that, but we probably would never do that because that's just not what society does. We, we talk about the wins. We don't talk about the losses. But what, what Paul's saying here is, is that, man, when, when, when the setback occurs, I'm going to boast about it because that's when the power of Christ can then start to work through me. And I, and I challenge all of us to get too many times we view the setback as the end of the goal rather than the beginning. You know, I believe when, when something happens, we set a goal out, and we, I want to accomplish this in my life, and then something goes wrong, and immediately we kind of say, well, maybe, maybe that's the end of that. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be that, or maybe I wasn't destined to be this. And the reality is that, man, just hang in. Just hang on, because that could be the beginning of where God takes over, where His power and that weakness starts to take over, and the impossible is just that much closer to being a reality. You know, I, I mentioned two out of three Americans set goals at the beginning of the year. Only 9% of them actually see it through to the end. And I think part of the reason is they start to experience pain. You know, if you think of the example of exercise, if you hadn't exercised in months or weeks or years, and your goal is to suddenly get in better shape, and you start exercising, and you start exercising, man, I'm, I'm kicking butt, this is great. The reality is the next day, you're going to be sore. And so many people look at it and say, man, I, I'm, in, I'm in some serious pain. <laughs> I think I'm going to take today off. I'm, I'm in too much pain. I'm, I'm going to take today off. Well, then the next day rolls around, you're still feeling a little tight, and, and then one day becomes two days. The reality is this. The pain just means you're doing something different and you're on the right path. When we pursue godly goals and God's will for our lives, we know we're on the right path. If there are setbacks, expect them and lean into them because that's where God does some of his best work. So godly goals draw us closer to God. They should be big. 
They're statements of faith. They take time. They come with setbacks. And finally, the sixth and last thing about godly goals is they yield eternal results. It says they yield results, which they do. They yield eternal results. Because the reality of the goals we set for ourselves, goals of the world, is we want results for us. We want that immediate impact. And we set them based on what our neighbors are doing or what our coworkers are doing or what our classmates are doing. And we had to ask ourselves, are we setting goals that if we hit, I get an earthly reward or a lasting impact? Does the reward for the goal I'm setting actually benefit me this week? Or is that benefit going to show up in eternity? Because I've invested into my community, I've invested into my kids, I've invested into the next generation, I've invested into something that God, I don't even know what God's working on, but it's going to reveal itself in eternity. The reality for many of us when we set goals is we look at earthly goals that will bring us the glory versus godly goals that will bring him the glory. I I want to be glorified by becoming famous, or I want to be glorified by losing this weight, or I want to be glorified by reading that book or, or appearing this way in my community. And the fact of the matter is what God's most interested in for all of us, the goals he planned out for our lives, is where the glory goes back to him, where the glory goes back to him in everything that we do and everything that we accomplish and everything that we achieve. The glory goes back to him. So are we in a cycle ethos or a rut of pursuing goals where all the glory goes to me or the glory goes to our maker? That's what we need to think about this new year as individuals and followers of Jesus. How do we set goals and prioritize our life so everything we do and everything we touch brings glory to God? And we need to start today, not because today is a new year, It's the second day of the new year, but it's a new year. But we need to start today because there's no better day to start. We can go home today and ask God, what are your goals for my life? What what did you write down as, as plans for my life, God? What are those plans? When he speaks to you, then write those down. Be be in partnership with God and in alignment with God on what those plans are for your life. Pray over them. And guess what? If as you're talking to God and you're saying to God when you go home tonight or tomorrow morning and you say, God, what are the plans you had for my life thousands of years ago when you wrote it down? If what you hear back isn't big and isn't bold and doesn't make you maybe even uncomfortable, then it may not be coming from God quite yet. And ask him again and ask him again so you know you're stepping out in faith. And once you hear from him and once you you have an understanding, I think this is where God's pushing me in my life towards goals for this next year, then go after it. Because the fact is, once we start working on the goal, God's going to start working on us, where he shapes our heart, where he shapes our mind into the character of him, where everything we do looks and feels more and more like our maker. So in conclusion, as I start to, to wrap up, One final thing I want to to talk about in terms of godly goals is God showed us what setting a goal with an eternal impact looks like. He showed us, he demonstrated what having a singular goal with an eternal impact looks like because there's no better example of an earthly life working toward a singular goal with eternal results than the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth with one goal, He had had, had a long life, 30 plus years of life where he performed miracles and he spoke to thousands and fed thousands and, and had an earthly ministry as we all know. But he had one goal. He had one goal. So all of us, so sinners could be reconciled with God. So we would have a place in God's eternal kingdom. That was his one goal. And it, it had setbacks. And this was a goal thousands of years in the making. And he had opportunities to to exit the goal. He had 40 days of of being tempted in in the wilderness. And and 32 days in, on average, he would have have tapped out and said, you know what, this is unbearable. But he had a godly 
goal that he never lost focus of. God could have snapped his fingers and made things right between mankind and himself. But he didn't. He, he wanted to demonstrate to us what having a godly goal with an eternal impact looked like. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. He suffered through the unimaginable because he knew, he knew what the goal was and ultimately who he was fulfilling it, fulfilling it for. You know, so many of us want to start the new year new, start it fresh. I, want to st- I just want to start new. I want to take 2021, and even by the end of 2021, we kind of just write off between Christmas and New Year's. It's like, I'm just going to eat what I want. There's cookies here. There's pe- what, what? You know what? It doesn't matter. I'm starting new. Jan 1st, I'm starting new. It's all new come Jan 1st, baby. We all want to start anew, and the reality is the gift of starting anew was given to us through the life of Jesus Christ so we could live to fulfill God's goals for our lives. That opportunity to start anew happened with the life of Jesus. Look with, look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where Paul writes, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This, this passage really just summarizes everything we've talked about. You know, first of all, we're God's masterpiece. I think too many of us set our goals for the new year thinking we're a mess and not a masterpiece. I'm a mess, man. I ate way too many holiday cookies, so I got to start working out again. I'm a mess. Last year, I had a, I had a really bad year at work, so I'm, I need to set goals in this part of my life. And I would challenge all of us, myself included, because no one thinks they're a bigger mess in this room than I think of myself. I'm a masterpiece. God, I'm your masterpiece. Let me press into the goals you have for my life. Why? Because I'm then created anew. Not because the calendar says I'm new, but because your son gave me the opportunity to be new. We were given that opportunity through the blood of Jesus. Why? So we can go do the good things that were planned for us long ago. It all comes full circle back to Psalm 139, where God had planned our days. He strategized our days. Planning is not fun. You know, the fun part of a project is the end part. Because if you think about we're we're looking to build a a property on Africa Road, the fun part's looking at renderings of the property. Because you're like, oh man, that's what it's going to look like when it's done. That's awesome. You know what the tough part is? The planning. Looking at blueprints and sketches and land graphs. It's like, oh man, he did the planning for us. He laid it out. He laid out the blueprints. And we can pursue it based on the life and the sacrifice of Jesus. That's amazing. We have a fresh start. And we don't have to wait to a new year to experience it. It's available to us right now. So God has these plans for our lives, and they are good. He sent his son to wipe away our past so he can pave the way for our future. That was the goal of Jesus and the eternal impact that he created. There has been no bolder or bigger goal to save humanity. There's been no goal that has required more faith than that of Jesus. There's been no goal that has probably come with as many setbacks as the life of Jesus, but there's never been a goal with more eternal return. You know, when we set goals, we often look for signs along the way to keep us motivated. This is a, an image from one of, one of my favorite television programs, Ted Lasso. It's a real highbrow uh, TV we're watching at my house. But you know, Ted Lasso put this sign up in his locker room because he has this kind of ragtag group of players. There was not, not much was expected of them. You know, they were kind of, the show's kind of like Major League, the movie, where they, the owner's trying to tank the season and, he, and, and, and she brings together these kind of players that no one expected them to win, no one expected them to do well. They hired this kind of bozo coach, Ted Lasso. Nothing's expected of him. Actually, he was hired because they were expected to lose. So she wanted to find the person who would lose the most. So he puts this sign up above the door, just believe. Guys, if we just believe that, you know, we can do it. And so many of us, we set these goals at the beginning of the year, and then we leave ourselves little notes along the way. You can do it. You can do it. I, I believe in you. We try to motivate ourselves. We try to motivate others around us. And I would challenge us this year, 
If we're looking for a symbol or something to keep us motivated on godly goals in 2022, keep us motivated, a symbol or a sign that could keep us on a godly path towards living out his purpose, then I think the symbol is really the cross. The cross that symbolized, as I said, the most bold goal ever of saving me and you and sinners, that we could be with God and we could live anew. That was the purpose of the cross. Think of the sacrifice Jesus took upon his body, allowed his body to be broken. As we sometimes think about how do we make our bodies more beautiful, Jesus thought, and how can I make my body more broken so that you can live free and you can experience my grace and my power. And that's my hope for all of us in 2022 as we walk in with faith. We walk in with the cross as a reminder that we can overcome through God's power. We can overcome and we can experience freedom and glory and purpose far beyond anything we could ever possibly imagine. Pray with me. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a planner. We thank you that you laid out our days, that you loved us so much that you would, that you would go to those depths to say, I have, I, have a, I have a plan for you, for your life, that you're a God who's patient, that you're a God who understands that we're going to mess up and we're going to make mistakes. But you sent your son to say those mistakes are in the past. Those mistakes, they're, they're, they're wiped away. They're clean. You're made anew through the blood of Jesus. God, may we enter this new year just boldly pursuing what you have for us in our lives. May, may, may it feel uncomfortable. God, may it feel slightly uncomfortable or maybe a lot uncomfortable because we know at that moment is where, when we're inviting your power in, when it no longer is about what I can do, but it's all about what you can do when I surrender myself to your will. God, we thank you for today and we love you so much. Amen. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. And I encourage you this week to really press in and ask God, invite God in to show, to show you what plans he has for you in your life. If you need prayer for any reason this morning, our prayer team is going to be up front. You know, please come up and have, ask them to pray with you. And we would love to, the opportunity to pray over you and for you and with you. And join us next week. We're kicking off a new series that we're calling Emotionally Healthy Relationships. And Jordan will be back to, to kick that off. But have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks for coming, and uh, you're dismissed. Thank you.